and I found a paper that compared big T trauma with what was termed little t trauma. And so directly compared individuals that had experienced big T with individuals who experienced little t. Growing up in a household where there wasn't abuse, but there wasn't much love. Other things like low-grade bullying at schools, things I called frenemies, people that you think you're friends, but actually there is victimization there. And what they found, it, it blew my socks off. It really did take my breath away because my expectation as a psychologist and a scientist was that, yes, the, the little t trauma would have an impact, but of course the big T would have a greater impact. This study found that, no, my hypothesis, my prediction was wrong. It was not supported by the evidence. The individuals who had experienced little t, what I now call tiny t, they had actually more severe outcomes over time than those individuals that had experienced the big T. And I was like, whoa, no one is talking about this. This is so important. So I say, be more cat. So, <laughs> so I, I am a cat lover, but I, I do watch my cat and I think, wow, you know, you just take everything as it is with curiosity. So think about your own experiences, but also your, your present challenges with a sense of curiosity and just see how that feels different. Does that feel different? And of course, these things, again, are skills and it can take some time to be comfortable with that, but have a go. My name's Dr. Gary Crotez, and I'm a coach, podcaster, and award-winning author of The Idea Mindset, a book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. When I'm in conversation with my coaching clients, these are the breakthroughs that are so profound that they remember vividly where they were, who they were with, what they were thinking when their unlock moment happened. In this podcast, I'll be meeting and learning about people who have accomplished great things or brought about significant change in their life. And you'll be meeting them with me. We'll be finding out what inspired them, how they got through the hard times and what they learned along the way that they can share with you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast to hear all about another Unlock Moment. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to another episode of the Unlock Moment podcast. I met today's guest a few months ago at a major national well-being event and was struck by her ability to make complex psychology simple in helping people to understand and deal with life's tricky problems. Dr. Meg Arrell is a chartered psychologist, scientist and author with a specialist focus on behavioural psychology related to health and wellness, invisible or misunderstood illness and everyday trauma. She's published widely in peer-reviewed journals and written seven books on topics ranging from chronic fatigue to emotional eating. She works on a one-to-one -one basis with individuals in corporate settings to improve health and performance and as an advisor to brands and the media. She's a regular contributor to publications such as the Daily Mail, Psychologies, Women's Health, Cosmopolitan and many others where she translates complex scientific theories and research for public dissemination. Her latest book is called Tiny Traumas, When You Don't Know What's Wrong but nothing feels quite right. I'm fascinated to learn more about the journey she made to focus in on tiny traumas and the unlocked moments of remarkable clarity that helped her to shape the path ahead. Let's dive in. Dr. Meg Arrell, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Unlock Moment. Gary, thank you so much. It's my great pleasure to be here and, and to continue our discussion, which we, we did start in that green room at, at the event. So thank you. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Now, I was struck by what it says at the top of your website. I'm a psychologist, but not as you might imagine. What does that mean for you? 
So over the years, I have um, I have a little bit of a bugbear sometimes with the way that psychologists are portrayed within the media. In terms that it's it's quite um, it's quite old fashioned still, isn't it? So the clipboard, the couch, um, you know, the the patches on on the elbows, that that kind of thing, and, and lots of beards. Gary, lots lots and lots of beards, but actually, psychology um, has come a very long way. And really, as psychologists, we take um, an approach of collaboration. And so, I would say I'm the psychologist next door. So, of course, fully trained and qualified, but it is much more of a conversation and less intimidating. I think that there are many barriers to seeking out psychological support. And some of those can be with, with our expectations of what a psychologist and what psychology is. And I would like to break down some of those barriers and think about it more as a very structured and professional collaborative chat often. And many of my clients say say to me, you're not what I was expecting. And I always take that as a huge compliment. (laughs) No elbow patches to be seen. Now, beginnings are important. Mm -hmm. And in my exploration of the unlocked moment, I'm discovering how this next question is an important lens on people's deepest underlying sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. Where do we need to start in your story to understand the person you are today? I think that's a very, very difficult question, but an amazing question in itself. And and aren't the best questions always the tricky ones too? So... Some, some very personal information. My, my father, uh, who is sadly no longer with us, um, we lost him during COVID, but, uh, he had, uh, bipolar disorder and he was, uh, undiagnosed and misdiagnosed for, for a long time. And he, he did try to take his own life when I was 14. And I do remember, I do remember that day very, very vividly, uh, to see the ambulance outside the, the door and to think that it was our neighbors who were a bit older and perhaps they had a fall or something. And then to see that, to see that it, it was him, but not just that moment. It really was the lack of support that we received as a family to try and cope with what had happened. And things are much better. We have moved on quite a bit, particularly with very severe psychiatric conditions like bipolar disorder. But I really felt that we were at sea. We were very much at sea. So that was a pivotal event in in my life, without a doubt. And such an age for that experience. I mean, often when I talk to people and they're sort of, you know, post-puberty, but sort of early to mid-teenage years, it's such a key time, Mm -hmm. you know, and when, when, when they have, you know, your kind of experience or parents going through divorce or things like that, you know, it's something that really often shapes people, Mm -hmm. you know, and I've heard that with other people that I've talked to here, but also in coaching, I often hear people talking about that kind of, you know, sort of 12 to 16 years. Did it shape your career journey, your career path, do you think? I think I was always fascinated in understanding the mind. And I remember being a a little girl in Arizona where I grew up before we moved to the UK, probably seven or eight and sitting alone on a swing in the middle of a desert because Arizona is, is a, is a desert and actually having what we would probably call some metacognitions now thinking about what I was thinking and being fascinated by that. And I still am. I still am. And so like everything is a combination of factors, isn't it? So then the experience with my dad and his mental health, um, very much wanted to understand the human mind and human behavior, because as we know, there's quite a big gap between intention and behavior and just exploring that. It's endlessly fascinating. And it's a field that evolves all the time. And I just felt that I would always feel very intrigued by it. And you just never stop learning. You never stop learning. So, yes. I'm interested by the language you use because some people say, I was fascinated to understand the brain and other people say, I was fascinated to understand the mind. What's the difference for you? What's the difference for me? Again, really good, but tricky question. So I think when we, when we say the brain, we're often talking about sort of neural anatomy, aren't we? And I feel like the mind obviously includes that, 
but it has an extra, very important part that perhaps we, we are still exploring and we're still trying to put our finger on. So the mind is, a, is more than our anatomy. It really is the combination of our experiences, our beliefs as well. And we could have the debate, well, of course, that starts in the mind and that's where it's based. I do think there's something additional. I, I do. And I believe that that could be sometimes termed as spirituality. It could be termed in other ways. But it really is that unique quality that makes you, you. And I have an acceptance around that, that that can be something that we can allow ourselves to, to, to sit with. And do we need to overanalyze that? If we are having difficulties, perhaps, but in other ways, just to, just to gaze in the wonder of it, I think can be important. And that sounds very unscientific for someone who is a chartered psychologist. But again, I think pondering on those, on those ideas and, and seeing where that takes you is joyful, I find. So it's your fascination in the mind, the fascination of the, of everyone's mind, or, or were you fascinated by people suffering with diseases or people suffering with depression, things like that? Some people go into psychology because mm. they want to help people who are suffering. Some people go into psychology because they're just fascinated by this amazing thing we, we have and they want to understand it better. What was it for you that drew you into psychology? I think it's both. I think it's all of the above. And so, actually, for, for a time during my PhD, I did engage in quite a lot of fMRI research. So I, I went down the route of, of looking very much at sort of the structural and functional differences and changes in individuals. But also to be just, I had this real interest in what really makes us who we are, but drives what we do. And those questions are somewhat more challenging to, to answer than to look for disease pathology or to really try and put people within those, those boxes and those categories. Because certainly in my own personal experience and in my life, it's quite important to allow for individuality and to have a much more flexible approach to people's lived experience. So my work is taking me much more towards looking at people's lived experience. And then I went from some very, very sort of objective, hardcore imaging work to doing some qualitative analysis within my PhD as well. And actually asking people questions and not assuming that I already had the answers to them. And that was an incredibly valuable part of my research too. Something I find really fascinating about psychology and I come across this all the time now in now in the coaching world, but mm. many, many years ago in my medical training I had a lot of this too. Is actually precisely the fact that there's so much we don't know. Mm -hmm. I think there are areas of medicine now more and more where we don't know everything, but we know an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And and the best medicine can be delivered quite a lot by algorithm. You know, if you are this age and you have this family history and you've been on those medications so far, mm -hmm. then these are the right treatments for you. But actually in, in psychology and in psychiatry, there's still so much that is not known. And mm -hmm. so I think that there is so much that is dependent on the skills and ability of the psychologist, the psychiatrist, the coach, the therapist, to be able to help people to mm -hmm. unlock their potential and to deal with issues that, that they're, they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating space. No, definitely. And, and I think it's... It's not, it's not just sort of psychological and, and emotional issues. So a lot of my research, I started off doing much more research and then moved more into private practice. And so my research was on, at the time, what we termed as medically unexplained conditions. So there are conditions that had physical symptomology, but often they were very psychologized, as we would say. I, I spoke with so many participants and patients that would say, you know, I've seen, I've seen a doctor and they've said it's all in my head. And I don't understand that because I'm having physical um, manifestations, uh, you know, physical symptoms that are very, very real to me and very, very debilitating. So some of our work was really to, to look at how, how did those experiences of not being legitimized in your medical journey, but also having that stigma attached, how did that impact your condition? And some of the findings were, were so very important and powerful that stigma and not being legitimized 
directly impacted not just psychological outcomes in terms of anxiety and depression, but directly impacted physical symptomology in conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, things where the etiology is very unclear and there's still a debate around it. Now, that was 20 years ago, so we have come further in our understanding of these conditions too. But my view is that these mechanisms will have an impact in all types of conditions. And so even where there is a clear cause, where there is clear etiology, if you do not have that support, that understanding from others, it will impact your lived experience. So those were some key findings in my early research career that I really did take forward. And, and they have been themes that have come up in all areas of my work as well. It's fascinating. When I think back to my medical training, which was cough 25 years ago, the term psychosomatic mm. was a slightly dirty word. Mm. It meant, you know, a physical symptom manifesting as a result of mental health, dot, dot, sort of isn't really there. Mm -hmm. And I think that in that 25 years, you know, I haven't been in medicine since then, but, but the raising of awareness and the legitimizing of a conversation around mental mm -hmm. health means that people are absolutely, and I include doctors and nurses in this too, taking much more seriously than they used to the, the understanding of mental health and the impact on physical symptomology as, as, as well. So how did you get into this space then of thinking about traumas? Mm. And what's the difference between big traumas and tiny traumas? Mm -hmm. So, and that's actually related to some of this research that, that we were conducting at the time. And Gary, as you know, as, as an academic, um, you will do your research, but you will also teach. And, and I, I, I loved the teaching. And one of the modules I was a lead on was a third year module. Uh, so it was an elective and it was called the psychology of physical illnesses. And we knew at the time that that was a, a little bit, a little bit out there. And we, we really named the module that to draw our students in. And we were always oversubscribed, actually. And one of the conditions I was, was lecturing on was, was IBS, was irritable bowel syndrome. And so. Every year, you, you know, you do more research, you update your notes and, and lecture slides. And I was thinking about some information that I'd known for a long time around trauma and physical health outcomes and how big T, major trauma. So living through a natural disaster, a war, early life abuse, these sorts of things. There, there is an association with poorer physical health outcomes later in life. And I just want to caveat that, though, that we do have very effective treatments for people that have experienced big T trauma. When I speak of big T, we're saying that the T is capitalized in the word trauma. But I knew from my research and also observations that that couldn't account for the whole relationship between very difficult experiences and symptom presentation. And so I, I did, you know, a, a lit review on it. And I found a paper that compared big T trauma with what was termed little t trauma. So lowercase t in the word. And so directly compared individuals that had experienced big T with individuals who experienced little t. So growing up in a household where there wasn't abuse, but there wasn't much love being misattuned with your caregivers. So perhaps having very different personality styles where you just don't really feel you, you, you fit in. Kind of other things like low grade bullying at schools, things I called frenemies, people that you think you're friends, but actually there is some, uh, there is some victimization there. And what they found, it, it blew my socks off. It really did take my breath away because my expectation as a psychologist and a scientist was that, yes, the, the little t trauma would have an impact, but of course the big T would have a greater impact. This study found that, no, my hypothesis, my prediction was wrong. It was not supported by the evidence. The individuals who had experienced little t, what I now call tiny t, they had actually more severe outcomes over time than those individuals that had experienced the big T. And I was like, whoa, no one is talking about this. This is so important because when we think about trauma, 
those low-grade cumulative types of trauma are actually more frequent. And I was like, we've, we've missed out this huge, huge area of mental health and trauma. And it stayed with me. That study stayed with me for the rest of my career. And then when I was working in private practice, what I was seeing on a daily basis really was this tiny T type trauma. And what my clients would say to me, first of all, Meg, I don't know why I'm here. And they would almost back out of my consultation room and nothing really that bad's happened to me. You know, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be feeling this way. And then when we were exploring, exploring their life course, always there were these incidences of, of tiny trauma and, and there would be a constellation of tiny trauma, sometimes mixed with big T, sometimes mixed with major life events. But when we were doing our work together, just having a label for that experience and having that validation that these things can be small, but do often have a big impact was so valuable within my work. So I'm fascinated in these unlocked moments of the moment mm. of figuring out. And I think what, what you're describing is really interesting. I think there's this idea of something suddenly became clear mm. that immediately afterwards felt in some ways really obvious. Mm -hmm. but, but before that moment, you hadn't seen at all. And, and maybe you felt well, neither has anybody else in, in my field really seen this before. Do you remember where you were when, when that breakthrough moment happened? Yes, I, I do. I was in my incredibly hot office in the University of East London because we had terrible air conditioning. It was those, you, do you know, you know those um, ones that you stick the hose out the window and it didn't work at all. With my lovely colleague and we were sweltering and I was sitting in my office and, and, you know, I said to her, I said, look at this study. I wanted to talk to her about it. But she was really busy doing some marking. And I was like, this is so important. And then later I discussed it with my co-leads on, on the module and they were also very excited by it too. But then when we did some more searching, it is something that has been relatively ignored within the scientific literature base and really hasn't been, been studied as, as much as perhaps one would ex expect. So it, it was those things that really did, did stick with me. And I've pondered that. I've, I've, I've discussed it with numerous colleagues, why that would be. And one of the conclusions we've come to is psychology is actually a relatively new discipline. It, it is new and it takes time for us to research lived experience, especially. But also when a uh, area of study starts, we do naturally focus on the most severe events, the most severe cases. And so if we take those two things together, that we kind of look at, 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 the, at the worst, but also that we're still quite new, it is a natural evolution. And we have done so well in the past 20 years to be talking about mental health more, to raise awareness about mental health more. And I feel now is the time to have that more nuanced conversation around trauma to be able to validate people's experience, but not, not just that. And it's not just because it's very important, but to be able to really supply people with, uh, with tools, with their own personal toolkit to be able to manage tiny traumas, but, but also to, to really self-coach. And coaching psychology is an area that I, I work in and that I really I, I adore because it does aim to tool people up to be able to manage what will come in the future. This is fascinating. I'm asking you this question for a reason. At that moment in that hot room <laughs> with the air conditioning, it wasn't working. And you had this breakthrough moment. How long had you been doing psychology in your career at that point? So by that point, oh gosh, Gary, this is a long time ago. <laughs> at that point, I was still an early uh, career researcher and an, and an academic. So, but because I had completed an undergraduate degree, a master's, a PhD, I had actually been studying psychology for a long time. 
So by that point, I'd probably been in the field, including all my studies for a good 10 to 15 years by that point. And what surprised me so much is I'd never come across it before. I just, right. if that's why it felt like such an unlock moment because I hadn't seen that anywhere before. And, and I hadn't been taught it as an undergraduate or postgraduate. This was in none of my own lectures. And it felt like such, such a, a missing link, as it were. Mm. So here's the thing. So I, I'm interested in finding patterns in people's unlock moments. Mm. And there's one that's coming to mind for me. It's a very early episode of the Unlock Moment podcast with Nazar Bati and Mariko Cantley, who are professional ballroom dancers. Completely different context. And they describe their unlock moment. After 30 years of professional dance training, they went to Italy and their teacher said, you're not on balance. And they went, what do you mean we're not on balance? We're professional dancers. We've been doing this 30 years. We're on balance. And he went, no, you're not on balance. You need to move forward another two millimeters. And they suddenly went, oh, <laughs> that's different. Wow. And their unlock moment was somebody telling them that sort of they didn't know how to dance and they needed to shift and they needed to do something slightly different. And it wasn't a new thing they were doing for the first time. They've been doing it a long time. Mm. They've been doing it a long time and nobody had shown them that mm -hmm. up to that point. And mm -hmm. I said to Mariko, how do you feel? And she said, angry. Mm -hmm. She said, I was furious on the bus on the way back to the hotel after that lesson. Not furious for him telling us, but furious that I hadn't seen it before. Because mm -hmm. I felt like once I knew that, it was so obvious mm -hmm. that we weren't on balance before and now we're on balance. And I see this a lot in, particularly as you describe, in emerging disciplines. Mm -hmm. You know, something like dance is actually something that is constantly evolving. You know, what we know in dance is a little bit like what we know in psychology. It's loads, but there's loads still to, to understand. And so there's an opportunity for people to go, here's the thing that now I've told you seems so obvious. I think also in the medical field of the guy that discovered that stomach ulcers were created by a bacterium mm. and everybody thought it was stress. Mm -hmm. And he went, no, I think it's bacterium. Mm. And they went, no, it's definitely stress. And the entirety of global medicine is based on the fact that we help you to reduce your stress, to reduce your stomach ulcers. And he went and drank some of his own stomach acid and cultured his bacterium out of it and got a Nobel Prize for it. Often we, we are fixed in this world of thinking that the world is one way. Yes. So I'm fascinated that that's your unlock moment that it's a sudden realization of something that before that moment was completely unclear and after that moment was incredibly clear. Mm -hmm. And you've obviously now built this whole practice mm -hmm. and educating other people on the science of tiny traumas, mm -hmm. say, or tiny T traumas. Mm -hmm. So bring to life, how does that play forward? Mm -hmm. So what should we be looking for in our own lives mm -hmm. for these tiny traumas that are, that are impacting us? So in, in, in terms of how we can identify things, I think it's much easier to start with the behavior because it's, it's, it's much more obvious to us. And, and why make it harder for ourselves? I think sometimes when we think about psychology, we always try and make things very, very difficult. But let's start with, with what is in front of us. So that's where, that's where I started with the book, but also very much within my, my own practice. So what I started to observe, and like you, I love to search for patterns. My goal is to connect dots, whether that be across individuals or within an individual client. And what I began to see were some very common presentations in the book. I call them themes. And so these are behavioral and thought issues that people would present to me with that if they went to their GP, most likely they wouldn't meet the diagnostic criteria for things like general anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder. They, they may be referred to some types of counseling or other psychological interventions, but oftentimes actually a little bit fobbed off, if I'm honest, and so lost of where to go for support. So the presentations, the themes I see are around high functioning anxiety. So people feeling very anxious a lot, if not all of the time, but still able to work, still able to care for their families, to do all the things they need to do. But it's feeling hard. It's feeling effortful. Very common presentation. I would say that that is the most frequent thing that I see within my clinic. 
Other issues like uh, emotional blunting, feeling very numb. So not feeling depressed. And again, a, a phrase I hear quite a lot in my clinic is, Dr. Meg, I'm not depressed. I know I'm not depressed, but I just don't feel much of, of anything. So not very severe low mood, but certainly not feeling, you know, joy, not feeling a sense of excitement, feeling pretty numb. Other things that are very much behavioral patterns in terms of emotional eating, difficulties with navigating life's transitions, sleep problems are a huge thing. So we can start at the presentation and work back from there. And to do that, I developed a three-stage process, which surprises me because I was always very, very against <laughs> sort of stage theories. But to bear in mind that um, we do need to, to have a path to follow, but also it is a dynamic process. And I call this the, the AAA process and the first A uh, stands for awareness. So being aware that that tiny T's exist and they do have an impact is, is, is the first point. But then being aware of our own constellation of tiny traumas, our experiences and how they have impacted us is a very important part of my work. Moving on to acceptance, because awareness is not enough. And I would say acceptance is the hardest piece. And the one that I see where individuals have skipped over it. And for, for, for good reasons, one, it's, it's hard, it, it's, it's challenging, but two, it's not something that's offered in techniques such as cognitive behavioral therapy. So, so some techniques that are quite prevalent these days don't really uh, attempt to help people gain a sense of acceptance. But then we need to move to action. And this is very much based on my coaching psychology experience. People want to know what to do going forward. And I think that as practitioners, we have a responsibility to, to give people some tangible type of techniques to take with them. And this, these are not the, the five-minute techniques that perhaps we, we read about because uh, work with awareness and acceptance is very important to get to this point because otherwise what happens is we'll try the actionable tips and hints and life hacks and those sorts of things but because that foundation has not been set, we'll sort of bounce back to awareness and, and feel quite lost within the process. So the book is very much about these different presentations that I see, but also how to use this AAA approach for all of these presentations. I really like how you describe that. It's accessible, but it's work. You know, it's oh, work to yeah. be done. Yeah. My book, The Idea Mindset, I say to people quite deliberately, it's quite hard work mm -hmm. because the self-reflection, there's exercises in it to do, you know, you can, you can figure out the path ahead if you put the work in. Mm -hmm. I don't, personally, I don't want to write those books that are in five minutes, I can make you a millionaire. Eat the breakfast that I eat and you too will become a millionaire. Mm -hmm. Those books, I don't like them because it's not real. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a little bit snake oil. And I think it's important to say it's, absolutely accessible and possible to do these things you know you can create remarkable change in your life mm -hmm. with some relatively simple changes but it does require persistence mm -hmm. it does require thinking about it. it does require facing into some of the hard stuff sometimes mm -hmm. it does require commitment you know what are the kind of characteristics of the people who are successful with going through this kind of mm -hmm. process what is it about them that makes them the people who are successful and others that don't share those characteristics maybe fail at, at making the change they're trying to make. Gary, I, I totally agree with you. It is, it is work. And what I always say is it's effortful. It takes effort, mm. but it's worth it. And I like to kind of make the comparison with, with physical health, bearing in mind that the, the mind and body interact. But if we just separate the two for a moment for, for a view on it, if we were going to, say if we wanted to get fitter, right? Say if we wanted to run a 5K, we wouldn't wake up one morning and, and think that just going out and doing a, a two-minute jog would enable us to run five kilometers. We would know intuitively that to be able to run 5K from not, not really doing much running, we would need to train. And it would feel like work. It would feel effortful. 
But we would get there. We would. And it is the same with psychological, mental and emotional health. And this is a sea change that is happening. It really is. And it really is starting to happen, though. So I feel very heartened around it. That understanding that, of course, it's going to take some work. Of course, it's going to take some time. So people that do tend to be able to work through the process, there are some important correlates here. Now, one is having support. I feel that we put far too much onus on the individual, which then leads to a sense of blame, self-blame. I haven't, you know, it's me. There's something wrong with me that I can't do it. We are social creatures. We are designed to live and exist in groups. When we have the support of others, we can resource ourselves and we can actually make the process attainable. So I, I do want to make the point that to to think about the context of an individual too. And sometimes we can't change all that, but sometimes we we can tweak it. So being able to resource in terms of other people and other areas of life and to really have that commitment because it can feel not just hard, it can feel painful. It can feel painful. Have the commitment to work with it, to work through it is incredibly, incredibly important. And also, I think it is something to do with us as practitioners. We are helping people to heal and to recover, just as a medical doctor, Gary, would. And so, again, if we were to break our leg, um, we wouldn't expect to know how to, to fix it. If someone's been through a challenging time, why would we expect that individual to know innately how to recover from that? It is our job as practitioners to offer people the techniques, the methods to be able to recover. So I want to very much say that it is all of our responsibility to to really help each other to be able to live a life that is more full of vitality and very much that sense of grounded peace. And it shouldn't all be placed on the individual. I've seen myself in my own friends and connections and network, quite a devastating impact actually of the pandemic on people's mental health mm-hmm. and mental resilience. What are you seeing in people you're seeing and the people you're talking to and the work that you're doing? on the impact of the pandemic? And what do people need to be doing now to kind of get them back to, you know, a sort of normal state of mental resilience? Mm -hmm. No, without a doubt, without a doubt. And so during the pandemic, during lockdowns in, in particular, we did not use that social muscle. And so just like any other muscle, there was some social atrophy so, you know, it, it, it shrunk a little bit. So our interpersonal skills, they, they weren't used. They did get a little bit wobbly. So in terms of how to deal with that is again, to think about it. I, I, I do use quite a lot of analogies between mental health and physical health to think about it in terms of how can I start to retrain that muscle? Gradually, we start small and, and we build up because it can be so overwhelming to go from no social contact to then being straight back out there. And so to do it gradually and with a sense of self-compassion, we are so hard on ourselves, Gary. We are so much harder on ourselves than we would ever be on anyone else. So to start small and to work back up. The other thing that I work with quite a lot and it has become such a problem is a behavioral addiction to the news, to news apps, to watching the news, to reading the news, which again is understandable. And I would say everything really does make sense when when we look at the chronology of it. So we were very much addicted to the news because we were looking at the, the rates every single day, numerous times a day. So to help people do a little bit of a, a news detox and to remove some of the apps and to define it, to take back control and to be very intentional. Yes, I want to know what's happening in the world, but do I need to know every two minutes? Maybe not. And to do a little bit of behavioral experiment around that. So to to ask people to note down how many times they're checking the news, how they're feeling on the scale of one to 10 in terms of those anxious feelings. And then when they cut it down to see the difference in their lived experience in terms of those anxious thoughts and feelings with the reduction of news consumption. Yeah. One of the things I was thinking about is that people that are coming and talking to you 
are people facing into challenges, but mm. they are people who are somewhat aware and somewhat open to talking to somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, by definition, the fact that they've walked through your door. It might be people listening here who've never talked to anybody about it, but they're hearing some of these stories and they're going, you know, I wonder whether that is me, actually some of the symptoms that you described earlier. Mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody in terms of a place to start if they're just for the first time thinking, hmm, maybe that thing I am feeling is something that I should explore. But, you know, often there's a lot of people who maybe from the role they're in, they may be in a position of leadership or there's sort of cultural constraints that mean they don't often talk about how they feel, their emotions and so on. What do you say to people in terms of where to start to be more open, mm -hmm. explore what's going on, talk to people? Talking about feelings and about our experiences is, again, it's really hard. Most of us haven't ever been taught how to communicate about our emotional experience. And so, again, why would we just know? Why would we know? Would we know how to play the piano just because we can see a piano and know what it looks like? No, of course we're not going to. So one way to really start to explore what I call our emotional inner world, that emotional micro world, is through writing. So journaling is very popular these days. And one of the barriers that I see is people will say, well, what do I write? I don't know what to write. And actually, you can start by writing anything. You can write what you did in the day and see if it, see where it takes you. You can use journal prompts. So not just in my book, but, you know, anywhere to search online, journal prompts for a day. See where it takes you. That can be a very important first point. There are other ways, though, in terms of really getting to know our, our feelings and, and having that sense of introspection and reflection. Using music can be really powerful. So one thing I like to do with clients is to work with them on curating a feelings playlist. So not just your favorite songs, a range of songs that instigate different sorts of feelings within you to be able to explore not just those feelings that feel good, those pleasant feelings, but perhaps more unpleasant feelings. Because everyone really loves the sad songs and there's a reason for that. And it is because it gives us, it gives us this way, this safe way to be able to explore some of those more challenging feelings. So there are many things that we can do and many different modalities as well to explore on our own when we're just, just getting started. Then I would say when we want to start talking, it, again, it can be very intimidating to, to see a professional talking to loved ones, to, to others. When we are walking is a really good start. And we call that walk and talk, shoulder to shoulder or eco psychology, taking the four walls away from that and just being able to start a conversation where you're not face to face with another human being is much easier. It's quite confronting to look somebody in the eye and actually that triggers a fear response within us. So having some conversations whilst walking, I had a client that said to me once, you know, Meg, that my most important conversations are always in a car with my children. And because we're not directly looking at each other. So kind of in the same, same way with when we're talking about detoxing, perhaps from news and social atrophy and all these things, I always start small. So when we're thinking about talking about difficult experiences, start with things like journaling, with music, build up, see where that takes you. And when you're looking for support, to think about practitioners in terms of it being a collaborative process and that someone is there to, to really walk with you on the journey. And it is very much about that interaction. You make me think of the episode that I recorded recently with my mentor coach, who's called Claire Petrick, she's master coach, and she goes on very long walks. She does walks the Camino in Spain, that kind of oh, thing, wow. hundreds of kilometers. And she said, if you walk alongside someone for long enough, eventually they tell you why they came. Oh, wow. But it's not necessarily on the first walk or the second mm -hmm. walk. And she said she was walking with somebody she was thinking of, and she said at the seventh walk, she told me why, why she was there. Mm -hmm. So that, I, that's, it, it's really resonant with what you just said, actually. When you were writing this book, 
Did you learn anything about yourself? Well, Gary, I would say that I learn something about myself in every single session I have with a client. I often say I, I, I may get more from it than, than my clients do. So certainly with the book as well, as well, w- without a doubt. So I'm in the book, you know, there, there are some of my own personal tiny teas in, in the book, in Interweave. So without a doubt, it was incredibly helpful to me. What was also helpful is that that kind of unlock moment had been with me for so many years to be able to get all of this information down on the page. It was so cathartic. It was so helpful, useful to me. And when I spoke to my agent about it, I said to her, I'm going to write it anyway. I would love, I would love it to be published, but I'm going to write it for, for me for my personal progress, but also for, for my work. And even if I give it to clients to have as a reference, that is enough because I wanted to get these ideas down on a page and put them into a structure that made sense for me and my work. I love that. And again, a pattern is some people with their unlock moments, the time between having the unlock moment and what they finally do with it can be a really long time. Dr. Richard Oshibanjo, who recorded, he's a world leading coach and chief of staff at Intel, said he knew at 18 that he wasn't going to be a chemist the rest of his life, but at 28 was the first time he could tell his dad that he was, he was going to leave his PhD and go into business. Mm-hmm. So it was a 10 year gap. Um, and it's quite common because at the time you know, you're ne- not necessarily ready to do something with it. Mm-hmm. And you're now in a place to put it together in a book. And I personally really resonate with idea, that idea of going, I have to put it down on paper, even if nobody buys mm-hmm. it, but it's, it's a really powerful process. So if people have heard this conversation or people read the book and you, you want them to do one thing coming away from that, what's one thing people can take away from this idea of tiny tea traumas to change what they're doing, change the way they think, change their life? So my, my one thing would be to, to think about tiny traumas in a mindset of curiosity rather than self-criticism. As I say, that's one of one of the, the big areas that I work with. So I say be more cats. So <laughs> so I I am a cat lover, but I, I do watch my cat and I think, wow, you know, you just take everything as it is with curiosity. So think about your own experiences, but also your your present challenges with a sense of curiosity and just see how that feels different. Does that feel different? And of course, these things, again, are skills and it can take some time to be comfortable with that, but have a go. I love it. And I love how you put things into such an accessible form that people can take these ideas and take them away and do something with them. Dr. Meg, how can people find out more about you and the work that you do? My website is drmegarrell.com, also on all the normal social medias, Dr. Meg Arrell. The book is available on the, you know, the, the big online sales platform, but also in physical bookstores in Waterstones in the UK. It's beginning to come out across the world as well. So yeah, so many, many avenues. And if anyone out there would like to share their experience on, on Instagram, we have quite some, some good conversation about it. And my goal really is to have, have this conversation about this low grade cumulative type of trauma to be able, to be able to, to validate and in a sense, normalize this for, for us all. Because what I find is people do feel a sense of, of shame for, for having difficulties when they feel like it hasn't been all that bad. But actually, if something has impacted you, then it is important. Oh, thank you. And I, can, and I know that so many listeners out there listening to what you say are going to feel heard, actually, for what you've just said. I really appreciate that. The Unlock Moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. For psychologist, scientist and author Dr. Meg Arrell, it was realising that tiny T traumas can be even more important than big T trauma in impacting the health of her patients that set her on a path to understand these issues that impact us all. Go to Amazon 
or your favourite bookstore and order a copy of Dr Meg's fantastic new book, Tiny Traumas, when you don't know what's wrong but nothing feels quite right. Dr Meg, thank you so much for telling your story and for joining me today on The Unlock Moment. Thank you. This has been The Unlock Moment, a podcast with me, Dr Gary Crotez. Thank you for listening in. You can find out more about how to figure out what you want and how to get it in my book, The Idea Mindset. Find me on Instagram at Dr. Gary Crotez and subscribe to this podcast to get notified about future episodes. Most listeners to this podcast on Apple and Spotify haven't yet hit the follow button. If there's one thing you can do right now to help me out, then please click the follow button. The more followers I have, the better guests I can attract for you to learn from. Thanks again for listening and join me again soon here on the Unlock Moment.